Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fourth session of our Forecast NL series, Focus North, Labrador at the Front Lines of Climate Change. I'm Rob Greenwood, I'm Director of the Harris Center and Associate VP, Public Engagement and External Relations at Memorial University. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Inu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located this morning and to consider the indigenous peoples for whom these lands our traditional territory. We've carved out 18 months for this project at the Harris Center. So these first few sessions have been looking at these topics in rather broad strokes, kind of setting the, the terrain on climate, economy, and society. And we will be returning to each of these issues in much more detail during future sessions. So if it feels like a topic is raised but not discussed in detail, don't worry. We're taking lots of notes on all the topics that get raised, and we'll be having lots more sessions to drill into the details. So if you'd like to make any suggestions on topics, we're open to that. Just send us a note in the chat box or the Q&A, or shoot us an email at the Harris Center at any time. Today we have Dr. Ashley Consolo, Dean of the newly established School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies at Memorial's Labrador Institute with us. She's going to give us an overview of some of the climate changes Labrador is currently seeing and some of the projections of what's to come. Then Ashley is going to moderate the discussion with the panel. We'll have about a half hour or so at the end for Q&A with the audience. So get your questions ready and feel free to post them in the Q&A box at any point during the session. We will be recording today's session and it will be posted online afterwards. Even if you're not watching live, you can still pose questions for further discussion in the online forum at www.harriscenterforum.ca. Kathy Newhook and Melanie Rousel are monitoring that all the time. And we're collaborating with our citizens forum from throughout the island and Labrador. Plus we have a steering committee, a knowledge mobilization committee, and a lot of other interested citizens. So it, it's a, an opportunity to build on the discussion here today. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to you, Ashley. Thanks so much, Rob. And thanks everyone for being here. This is such a special panel for me to be moderating. It's such a, a pleasure and a privilege, especially with the four panelists that we have here who I'll, I'll be introducing shortly. And I, I also want to reemphasize um, the, the land acknowledgement. You know, the four panelists and myself, we're all calling in from Labrador, which is the homelands of the Innu and the Inuit. And we have representatives from all three indigenous governments and regions today. And they're all going to be talking about how climate change is affecting Labrador. So I'm going to start off um, with a brief overview of what we're seeing in Labrador right now uh, and, and what some of the projections are to come. Now, you know, we're talking focus north. And so I really wanna emphasize that right now, Labrador is already experiencing many effects of climate change and has been for some decades. In fact, Labrador is considered on the front lines of climate change anywhere in the north, including the circumpolar north, as, one as, as well as one of the fastest changing places anywhere in the world. So I wanna start with this past winter. If anyone's been watching CBC and the On Thin Ice series, uh, and listening to the news reports, this past winter has been very, very difficult in Labrador. So courtesy of Dr. Robert Way and our Northwest River Climate Station, we have some new data that's come out that's looking at the data from December to March, 2021. And in this time, we saw temperatures that were four to six degrees above normal for winter. There were zero days with a mean temperature below minus 20. And this is remarkable because normally over this time, it's 20 to 30 days that are below zero or below minus 20, I should say. There were 13 days where temperature was above zero and normally there's only zero to two days. And there were 82 days where the snow depth was greater than hundred centimeters. So what does this mean? This means it was an extremely warm winter. There were no cold spells. There were numerous warm spells. There was lots of snow. And as you're gonna hear from the panelists, it was terrible for ice. 
So I want to show you a picture from Eldred Allen, who runs Bird's Eye Inc. in uh, Rigolet. So this was Double Mirror on April 22nd, 2020. And this year, this is Double Mirror on April 16th, 2021. So you can see in this very clear picture, the remarkably warm winter and what that looks like when you're looking at the land, when you're looking at the ice and when you're looking at snow conditions. So what are some of the projections that we're seeing? So we know that Labrador is one of the fastest warming places in the North and in the country. And it's warming at three times the rate of the rest of the country. So on average, there's already been 10 to 15 days less of sea ice. This year it was much more. But what's particularly important is when we're looking at the climate projections, Labrador is expected to see about an average of eight to 10 degrees projected increase in temperature by 2100. So that's an average temperature change. So what that means is that winter in Nain in 2100 will look like St. John's winter today. And by 2100, winter temperatures are gonna be looking more like fall and fall temperatures are going to be looking more like summer. And this data is courtesy of Dr. Joel Finnis at Memorial University. So, you know, I wanted to set the stage with that because these are really important to understand that what you're going to hear today uh, and what people are going to be talking about is something that has already been happening and is going to continue to happen and continue to worsen. Uh, and when you're looking at places like Labrador and when you're looking at people who rely closely on the land and who have thousands of years of connection and place-based knowledge and activities and cultural continuity and wellness, these uh, changes have enormous impacts. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists now. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce the four people we have joining today. So first we have Mr. Stanley Oliver. Stan, if you wanna give a wave. Stan was born and raised in Labrador. Uh, his father was from Rigolet and his mother from Northwest River. And he has 11 brothers and sisters. As an Inuk, Stan is an avid hunter, fisher, and outdoorsman. He has over 30 years of working in the natural resources sector and has held a variety of senior management and leadership positions with the Nunatsiavut governments, the Nunatuvut Community Council, and the Atlantic First Nations Congress. Stan is a member of our Citizen Forum as well for Forecast NL. So welcome, Stan. I'm also happy to be welcoming Abigail Poole. Abigail was born and raised in St. Louis and known to many as Fox Harbor and is a member of Nunatu, the Southern Inuit of Labrador. She also just graduated this semester with an honors degree in psychology, so congratulations. And she has a passion for human behavior and mental well being, particularly around the connections between the land, water, ice, and mental health of people in Southern Labrador. Abigail is also a member of our Forecast NL steering committee. And we also have joining us by phone, Ms. Jody Ashini. So Jody was born and raised in Sheshashit, Labrador, and she is trained as an archeologist and is currently the Innu Heritage Guardian for the Innu Nation. Jody is a strong advocate for the preservation and promotion of Innu culture and works tirelessly to support awareness of and education for Innu history and heritage. And finally, we have Mr. Derek Pottle joining us from Riglet. And Derek was born and raised in Riglet, Nunatsivit, and lives a traditional Inuk lifestyle as a hunter and gatherer. The changes he has seen over the years allow him to bring awareness to the challenges Inuit face in today's world. Derek loves being on the land and sharing knowledge and skills of living and surviving on the land. And he's also a renowned carver and artist and is a bear guard and instructor. So as you can see from our four panelists, there's extensive knowledge and land-based connections. And so the first question that I have for you, and, and Derek, I'll turn it over to you first, is what are the changes you've been seeing over your lifetime? And what are you seeing in Rigolet and, and in Labrador? Hey, um, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Ashley. And uh, I'll try to ask, answer your question to the best of my ability. You know, as far as I can remember back, um, you know, traveling around with my father and my grandfather and some of the older hunters that uh, that we that we um, went with and uh, traveled with, uh, you know, hearing their stories from back, you know, when they were, you know, starting out and living on the land to the changes what we see today, what, you know, the tangible changes that we're seeing. And it's... Uh, Pretty scary uh, if you stop to think about it. How fast, in a very short period of time, how things have uh, have changed. It's probably less than twenty five years that we started to really focus on global warming and the aspect of what we're seeing. And let me say that um, you know each each community in each region is impacted different uh, differently. Um, 
you know, we see some changes here in Ringlet and I can focus on more to the Ringlet area and Lake Melville area. I know that on the South Coast, um, you know, they're probably having something similar to the changes and the challenges that we're having. Lake Melville is also the same thing, but you go a little bit north and Maine now today, they're still using snowmobiles. But even having said that, I talked to the hunters and the people that go on the land in each community and everyone is challenged. Uh, you know, the, this past winter has been probably the most challenging with respect of lack of sea ice, uh, huge, huge dumps of snow. It started snowing in October and we still got probably six or eight or even 10 feet of snow on the land now, but we got no ice. So you see those changes, you see those challenges and those changes and, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's changes that we've never seen before. We've, we've always dealt with mild weather and, you know, fluctuation in temperatures. And, uh, but at the end of the day, you had enough cold weather that you made good solid ice and, uh, you could travel on snowmobile the end of May and into June, even when we were, you know, back in the, uh, in the, uh, sixties and seventies and even into the eighties, I remember being on dog team and snowmobile. Uh, hunting seals on Lake Melville in late May, early June. Uh, I put my snowmobile away this year, the 17th of April, because the conditions just fell apart. Um, it's just like, it's we've never seen that before. I'm, I'll just stop and give somebody else a chance to add or comment on yeah. what, what I said. Thank you so much, Derek, and thanks for sharing. And, and Jody, I'm gonna turn it over to you on the phone. What have you been seeing over the, the past years around how climate change is affecting Sheshashish and Natoashish and the Inu Nation? Well, hi, thanks for having me. Um, there's big change, and I'm only 35 years old, and I've traveled a lot in my, in my life, and I've spent months on the, on the land in the country as a child, and seeing the difference today compared to as a kid there's there's major changes the ice like like Derek said is gone we have nothing and we just got back but we put our skidoo away too just end of April there's nothing we could we couldn't get around no more so it's it's the just in my 35 years I can I can see the major changes with the snow and the warmth that was so warm this year, we didn't have, I don't think we had any days over minus 40. And what we were used to as kids is we'd get down to minus 50 and no one blinked an eye, but this year we didn't get that. We didn't have any of that. So it's, it's, it's a real scary thing to think about the future for my little girl, not being able to do the things that I did as a kid to be able to go on skidoo we had to wait so long to be able to go on skidoo this year to the cabin for the ice to be safe because it's just snow ice there wasn't ice that was formed there was just snow so it's a it's a very scary thought but this point in time to figure out how our our next generations will be able to continue these traditions yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jody, and for bringing up the concern over the next generations. And that's certainly something we're going to talk about on this, this panel. Um, but first, I'm going to turn it over to Stan, and then I'm going to end with Abigail, who did want to talk about that, that next generation and how it's affecting young people. Okay, uh, thanks, Dr. Consolo. Um, and thanks to the Harris Center team and for uh, allowing me to participate today, and welcome to all the other panelists. Uh, I apologize if this, the following is a bit seems scripted, but as I mentioned to the planners, I wanted to kind of put my thoughts down in a formal way. Uh, so uh, you have to bear with me for a couple of minutes. Um, as Inuit, we always consider ourselves similar to other indigenous groups in the North, caretakers of the resource. And of course that entails looking after the land, sea, and waters. And in the Inuit word, we call it sila, which means weather, climate, environment. But to us, it's deeper connection to the land and to the water and what all that means. <laughs> As part of our caretaker and living with the land and waters, we have been observers for thousands, hundreds of years. So we're the first to feel those impacts, the very thing that we're here to talk about today. 
For many years, we know things are changing around us. As Derek and Jody have said, we know things are changing. We know we have to adapt, but it's not easy. And, it's, and it is scary, as Derek said. So I want to show, share with you just a brief story for two seconds. My family, as you mentioned, Dr. Casolo, is from the north and Upper Lake Melville in Northwest River across from Sheshashi. My wife's family are long, hundreds of, hundreds of years ancestry in hunting and trapping from the community of Mud Lake. In their early livelihoods, they spent their life trapping and hunting, primarily in the Kenemu River area. They would walk from Travispin to Kenemu, and what we call four days walk or four days tilts, hunting and trapping all the way. They would live off the land and eat what they had. They would leave in October and come back just before Christmas. Freeze up was usually the middle of November and spring thaw was the middle of May. End of May, if we were lucky. As Derek mentioned, as Jody mentioned, there were times when we could be on the ice in June. Now that has changed. There's a later freeze up and a later and an earlier thaw. Lots of times we cannot go to Kenemu River till January and we gotta be out of there in the middle of April. So we know things are happening around us. We are on the front lines. Like many areas in the North, the seasons dictate the way indigenous people and in particular Inuit operate. Spring was a time to seal hunt, a time to cut wood on the early morning frost, ice fish and get your nets ready for the summer. Summer was a time to fish, grow vegetables in Upper Lake Melville area, not so much on the North Coast. Fall was a time to hunt geese, rabbits, partridges, and go trapping. Winter was a time to trap, hunt, fish. It was hard work. Now the weather is unpredictable. It's unsafe, and we are sometimes unable to do what we once done. This affects Inuit in many ways. Our well-being, and those skills we learned from our elders, we're struggling to be able to pass them along to our youth. How to trap, how to fill snowshoes, bring fishing nets to. They're, those things are being lost. And getting out on the land and water is very important who we are, is what we are, and what makes us Inuit and Inu. Even in my short 56 years, I have witnessed so many changes. As mentioned, like we cannot go where we once walked. When it's unsafe, ice is softer now. There's more snow. There's more southwest winds compared to northeast winds. We see different fish species, such as American chad and striped bass in Labrador, with less char and capelin. There's more fog in areas. In Upper Lake Melville, we never used to see fog. We commonly see fog. So as Inuit, we scratch our heads. We wonder what's going on, and we are sad. It affects our mental health and it drastically affects how we live. We know this is happening, folks. We worry. We wonder about the future. We wonder, as Jody said, about our youth. How do we teach them? How do we show them? So not to be too spiritual, but the Bible says every year there, there is a time to sow and a time to reap. Well, folks, times are changing and we struggle with how we will live. That's it. Thanks so much, Stan. And you covered so many. Oh, I'll just wait for you to meet your line there, Stan. Perfect. Yeah. You've covered so many of the themes and so many of the things that we wanted to talk about today and so many of the, the interconnections. And I think that's so important um, for, for all of us to know and for the audience to know that these things are interconnected. They're not separate. And so I'm going to turn it over to Abigail because I know, you know, she, she has this particular expertise in psychology and thinking about mental health and land, and then also talking about from a youth perspective and a young person's perspective about what this means for the future. So Abigail, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thanks, Ashley. You can hear me okay? Good. Okay. So I think, I, and I've obviously, I've thought about this a lot before right now, but just hearing more of what Stan had to say and all of you. The big things here seem to be uncertainty, change, and loss, because it is a lot what we are experiencing, especially in indigenous populations. 
it is a loss of cultural traditions, you know, their everyday, what they would do on an everyday basis is changing or they're losing that. And so those three things, loss, uh, change and uncertainty are three things that people typically don't do so well with. People are generally, you know, they find contentment uh, and comfort in what is familiar. And so basically what we're seeing with the climate changes in especially Labrador communities is that those three things are just doing a total flip. And it seems that people don't know what to do with that. And of course they don't because they have not experienced this before. This is a total like new thing that people have to deal with now. And it's funny, the, the stats that you went through, Ashley, at the beginning, I had cold shivers as you were reading them because I can't imagine I'm saying I can't imagine, but I, I very well can. And it's very real. And so we need to think about it in that way. Um, but I can't imagine winters around home being like winters in St. John's. That's totally, that's just not a concept that any of us ever thought about until recently, I would imagine. And so that is a very scary thought. And it's, it definitely is real in my family too. I'm all throughout the winter while I was in Cornerbrook and I, I did spend most of the past four years in Cornerbrook. So I have been a little bit, I guess, not as close to all these changes as my family and as, a, as other people. But every day that I would call my dad at home, he, every, it, he would tell me a story about being in the cabin or in the woods or fishing or whatever. And he still did all those things. But every conversation he said, my God, what a horrible winter we're having. Because as Stan and the rest of you have, already highlighted it's it was a warmer winter ice was not the same I I remember ice would freeze from St. Louis uh right over straight across to Mary's Harbor Bay and people would be able to go on skidoo right straight across and from what you're saying those stats I don't know if we'll ever see that again and that brings it when I'm thinking about that myself I'm only 21 and I, I do think about when I'll have my own family one day and how I definitely want to raise my kids in the way that I was raised at home. It's a disheartening and it, it makes me a little bit emotional, honestly, that they may not see what we see and what I saw growing up in my 21 years because there's no denying those stats. There's no denying the changes. They are here and they're coming and they are worsening. But on a positive note, (laughs) conversations like these are, you know, the bright side because it's so necessary for people to get educated. Um, and for you specifically, sorry. Um, I think that young people have a very strong interest and they're, they're passionate about climate change generally do I think there needs to be more in indigenous communities? Definitely. I do. I think young people are, you know, they have that drive to make the change and educate people and become more educated themselves. But I feel like that isn't as prevalent maybe in indigenous communities as it could be and as it should be. And I hope to see increases in that. And I hope that I can help initiate those increases. Thanks, Abigail, and thanks for sharing, and, and particularly those three points that you brought out, the uncertainty, the change, and loss. Uh, you know, many people are talking about that we are living in an era of loss, uh, and how we deal with that loss, and how we, we deal with the emotions that are with it, and what that means is going to be a defining feature of, of how we move forward, and especially in Labrador and other places that are changing. So Derek, I'm going to bring it back to you. I mean, for over 10 years, uh, you and I have been working together on research and you've been a a strong advocate, particularly around how it's making people feel and how people are being affected uh, and what the impacts are on sort of on mental and emotional wellness and also culture. Um, So I'll, you know, if you have any additional things you want to add to what Abigail and the other panelists have been saying. Thank you. And um, no, you know, everybody's making it's pretty obvious that the uh, that we all have the same concerns. Uh, it's it 
there's no there's no denying you know up until this past year as you said you know we worked together and even before um you know i became a uh, a part of your team you know we've had people that would come to our communities and ask questions and do studies and it's been identified but you know in the back of my mind i was always thinking that uh, you know maybe uh, maybe it's maybe some something is going to happen and it's going to go back something similar to what we had in uh, normal winters and normal seasons but what i saw this past winter it's really really struck home to me this past winter well it was not even worth calling a winter it was like a like a fall season that ran for you know the the calendar year and um, and to see to see to witness how the changes are like you know, as, as you know, we have a couple of cabins between Cape Harrison and Riglet, and uh, they're right out on the Atlantic Ocean. We couldn't even polar bear hunt this year. The, there was no ice. And uh, you just go there and uh, right from the, the the land, right from the, 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 the beginning of the land, right out into the ocean is, is, is all blue water. There's, there's nothing. There's no ice. And when you do get a couple of cold days, uh, you get... Terrible, terrible, strong winds, and the sea comes up and it just beats up everything, and and the ice don't have a chance to form and catch up. <clears throat> Though and the, the weather is not cold enough, uh, you know. Like I, I challenge anybody to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in order to have good ice, you got to have cold weather, and this is why we're seeing uh, in the springtime now. Uh, as soon as the frost goes out of the snow. As soon as the frost goes out of the snow, everything falls apart. It's just held together on top, and it just falls right to pieces. We don't see, <clears throat> you know, in in the winter time, you would see slob ice running for days and months at a time, and we were terrified of slob ice because it could just sweep you away. It was thick, greenish blue, just ice and water mixed together and moving constantly all the time. We don't see that anymore. We don't that that you don't you don't you don't witness that anymore. And you know the those tangible things when you're out on the land and you see that and you and you feel it and you're a part of it. And uh, a couple of days ago, I, I I killed a seal and um, I cleaned the seal and I washed my hands off after I cleaned it. After I uh, um, we call it pilak in the Nutritut, After you cleaned it and cut it up and uh, I pilak my seal and. Uh, you know, I, I, I washed my hands off in the snow and then I took my knife and I washed my hands off in the, in the water and, and the water is warmer than what the snow is. And, uh, you know, your hands don't even get cold. And in the, in the summertime, when you're netting fish, one time the water was so cold, the fish would be proper stiff. They'd be, as soon as they die, they become really stiff and, and uh, you could hardly bend them. And the water temperature is so warm now the fish don't even get stiff in a net once they die. I mean, fish in a gillnet die very fast. And once they're dead, usually they were so stiff, the water was so cold, your hands would actually hurt cleaning fish in the water or seals in the water. Now you don't, you don't feel that cold, coldness in the water. So all of those things, I mean, and you put all of those together and it becomes very, very concerning. And one of the things that really bothers me and concerns me is that in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, are we gone too far? Will we be able to get back to what we used to know uh, 20 and 30 and 40 years ago? Uh, it's really scary. I, I, I've said this before. You know, if every Inuk in Inuit Nunagak, 65,000 people stop driving snowmobiles and using cars and they shut down all the power plants in, uh, in our homelands, uh, would it make a difference? I don't believe it will. Uh, it's way, way bigger than what we are, but we still have a role to play. And that, that's what's scary. That's the thing that scares me, is all of these changes are way, way past what we are and where we are. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Derek. You uh, brought up a wonderful point, too. If anyone's um, interested in learning more, there's a great book by Sila Wat Kluche called The Right to be Cold. And it talks about how people in the north, it's a fundamental human right um, based on thousands of years of connections in a land that was cold to have still access to ice and snow to live those cultural traditions. 
Um, so Jody, I'm going to turn it over to you. But first, I want to remind all of our wonderful uh, participants and guests on this this webinar today that you can start typing your questions in. We're going to turn it over to Q and A um, very shortly. So we're really looking forward to hearing uh, from from everyone. So I'm going to turn it back to Jody and then Abigail, and then we'll be going into Q and A. So get those in the chat, uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing your perspectives and questions. Um, so Jody, you know, you mentioned when you were talking, uh, well, and, and all, all the panelists have talked about it being scary and, and sense of fear. And Jody, you talked about your daughter and, and wondering what it was going to be like for her. And then also the work that you do as the Inu Cultural Guardian. I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, that, that connection with what's changing and how that's impacting culture and what people um, in Sheshushi and Natoishis are, are talking about and concerned about right now. Yes, <clears throat> sorry. I was raised lonely. We went to our cabin for a month and really took the time to be the, on the land, be respectfully on the land. And we took our little girl. We took her out of school. We took her for a, we took her for a month to be able to get the, a little bit of the experience that I had as a kid. We go into the country about mid-April till the end of June. And at that point, we have to make sure that the planes could still land on skis on the ice. So April, you could still land a plane on skis on ice. And then we wouldn't be able to come back till a float plane was able to come back. So that was the end of June in the country. So, and now seeing it now, there's, there's no ice, there's no ice at all. Like, so there's, it's just making it difficult for trying to teach those things on the ice and the land. And it's, it's just not, it's not even, it's, it's, it's very different than when I was a kid, I was able to get around on skidoo, like I said, till the almost end of June in the country and trying to show my little girl little things, but it's just, it's, it's dangerous now. It's not the same as it once was. So, it's very concerning and like like I said too like being the cultural guardian there's there's things that we don't want to lose and it's very important that we be able to pass on these traditions and cultures to our to our next generations but like it's not it's not going to be feasible soon we're not going to be able to pass on those traditions of putting a net out under the ice or these things of that are slowly fading away from our our culture because it's just our our lifestyles as so though it's just it relies on the snow and ice and it's it's not there anymore so it's there's very big concerns for me is trying to work on like the cultural center and trying to get these snow and ice activities documented and just before it get like before it gets too late before it's before they're all gone from our recent memories, we're losing elders at a rapid pace. So once they go, like that knowledge of the snow and ice will be gone with the snow and ice in them. So it's, it's very concerning, very concerning. Yeah, it is very concerning indeed, Jody. And thank you for sharing that. And Stan, you've mentioned um, before when we were talking about this panel about um, talking with elders and seeing how knowledge systems are changing and how elders are, are concerned that some of the things that they know about how to predict weather, how to predict safe travel are no longer holding up in these new changes um, and, and how that shifts how people then travel safely and, and access the land. And then as Jody was talking about preserve and, and promote that culture. You know, one time you would ask elders about the weather and getting ready for seal hunting or reading the ice. And the elders will tell you now that they find it very unpredictable. Seal hunting now is very dangerous. This year, very few people went sealing in Upper Lake Melba. It was just way too dangerous. We put our, like, like others on the panelists, I put my snowmobile away a good month ago. It's just way too dangerous. You know, we can't read the ice in Upper Lake Melville in particular. The, in the spring, there was always two layers of ice and we knew how to read the ice. We knew where to stay away from. We knew where the seal holes would be and we knew where the cracks, you've traveled on the cracks away from the, the ice, soft ice. But now, you know, there's ice is soft. It's only one layer. 
It's hard to read. It's dangerous. Uh, but back on some of the questions about mental wellness and what Derek and your, yourself were talking about, you know, we feel stuck in our communities. The elders feel stuck. You know, it's almost like a feeling of forced isolation. We can't go to the cabins. We can't hunt. We can't fish. <laughs> Fellers like myself at, you know, my age, spend way too much hours in my shed thinking about going fishing and hunting and being on the land. Our faces aren't red anymore from the spring. You know, we're way too pale. And the older people will say, oh my, are you sick? When you're tanned up like Mr. Pottle, oh my, you look so healthy today. And you must have been out on the ice. Yes, I was, but we can't go like we used to. And, uh, you know, we're, we find it dangerous to take our grandchildren in. So, you know, we're losing those things. That affects the very well-being of what we feel and how healthy we are. It affects our health, our mental wellness. And again, when we don't have that, and our elders, that the ones that are still with us, and some, some of us are quickly moving into that age, Derek. Uh, you know, we can't pass that on. So, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Our elders and ourselves don't know what to tell people. Like, it's so unpredictable. In the year, last year, we had a tremendous amount of snow. This year, we hardly had, you know, there's a little bit of snow. Jody mentioned, we, I don't think we did have a day minus 40. We might have had one day was minus 25 plus. And it's blowing all the time. The tides are so high. It's just, I don't know, like, I, we just says, it's, it's crazy. What's going on? And, uh, you know, makes us nervous and it affects who we are. Thanks, Stan. And before we get to the audience questions, I see we have a number coming in and people with their hands raised. I'm going to uh, go over to Abigail. But Sam, when you said, um, you know, spending a lot of time in your shed thinking rather than doing, that's something that uh, for the past over 10 years we've been hearing all through Labrador um, when we do this research is people are saying, I'm sick of thinking about doing what I used to be able to do and I'd much rather be doing it, um, you know, and, and I think that's that's one of the, the serious loss um, and people just not having that ability to do what they always do and what they have always done and what their parents and grandparents have, have done. So Abigail, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. And I, I know, um, you know you've been, been thinking about this a lot and that a lot of your, your friends and people of your age have been talking about this and what it means for you um, in Labrador and what you're thinking about in terms of how it's affecting you now and how it's affecting your future. Before I get into that specifically, um, Stan said something about feeling like you're being forced to isolate. And so in a time where we actually are having to isolate, what, do, what are we doing if we're not outside doing what we love to do during these times? So COVID is also obviously a very important part of the conversation because I know I hear from a lot of people since COVID started, they would spend more time outside, like doing the things they love or getting back to some old hobbies or whatnot. And so if, if being outside uh, is the most important thing to a lot of people in indigenous communities doing what they love out on the land and water and ice, but they can't do that either, then what, then what do they do? And unfortunately, a lot, a lot of what we see is an increased use in substance use, which we already know is generally higher in indigenous populations than uh, the average person. And so I think that climate changes are also influencing substance use in indigenous communities. So just through this, this discussion, we're seeing that you, you really can't have a conversation about the outside without talking about the inside uh, and things like substance use, they really all do go together. And so to get back to what uh, you kind of prompted there, Ashley, about young people um, and their future, my future. I am very hopeful because I know that me and a, a lot of my friends and a lot of people I know and are close with are going to get the education that they want and need to I guess, give back to their communities about what it, it may be climate change, it may be uh, mental health or, or whatever. And so I think 
young people are taking the right steps. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to do what may need to be done. Um, but as Derek said, it's, it's a matter of like, is that enough still though? Which is a sad, it's a sad and scary question, but it is a legitimate one. And I think we all kind of think that way. And so I think young people are doing what they can. And well, I mean, they are doing what they can. There's always more to be done. And that's what's exciting about these conversations is that we can figure out ways that um, we can do more. And that's what's important. Um, but also the other side of that is I know like my community and many other Labrador communities uh, generally are older populations. There's not a whole lot of new people coming in, at least not into my community, St. Louis. So that is a particular concern for me because unless something big happens for St. Louis, uh, generally the people are older and people kind of move away for jobs uh, and more job opportunities. And so I just hope that younger people can come back or at least be where they are and somehow give back uh, to their communities in, in these kinds of ways. So in terms of climate change or mental health or whatever it may be. Thanks. So I know much, I Abigail. am. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely are. Yeah. And, and thank you for making that connection with not being able to talk about the outside without being able to talk about our inside world and that, that deep connection in Labrador that, that people are, are completely connected to the land um, and that what happens on the land also affects individuals. So, so thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy now. She's got uh, some questions from our wonderful audience. So thanks everyone for being here. And I know our panelists are ready to answer what you're wondering about. Okay, we've had a few questions come in in the uh, Q&A and there's really, um, it really seems to be all related to one theme. Um, one of the um, one of the attendees suggests um, we're on a trail from where there's no getting off during our lifetime, and and if so, should we explore how to adapt to the new norm and to play a significant part in our future? Um, and another person commented, um, you know, acknowledging the fear about uncertainty, change, and loss. Have you heard any positive brainstorming from community members about how we as Inuit and Innu might adapt cultural practices to these changes? So it's really, um, there's, and there's three different questions there, all related to, um, you know, where do we go from here? You know, if the, if the climate has already changed, there might be no getting back to what it was in the 1980s. Um, so how do we, how do we adapt to that? How, how do uh, Labradorians kind of, it, it, learn to live with that change somewhat while we all work to, um, to mitigate whatever um, possible changes are to come. Thanks, and, and maybe we'll start with Jody on that one because I know Jody, you've been doing uh, that work um, specifically as the Inu cultural guardian and then we'll, everyone else can then jump in with, with your thoughts and comments on that about how do you live with this knowing this is the, the present and the future. That's, that's a difficult question, one that you don't want to answer, right? Like you don't want this to be the new norm, but it that that sad accepting fact that then that's what my like job now is trying to gather that information of these winter activities that used to happen and somewhat still happen now, but like those need to be documented. This needs to be preserved. It it the kids need to know that this used to happen. This is, was our way of life, but because it's not happening, it, it doesn't mean that we're any less in it. We're, we're still, these were still our practices. It's just, we have to understand that this is what's going to happen from now. It's like, it's got to be documented. It's got to be visited almost at a museum. And that's it's sad. It's very sad. It's, uh, it's a very difficult question to answer very difficult. Now, Derek, uh, do you want to jump in on that question there? Yeah, I'll, thank you, Ashley. I'll, I'll try to do try to do my very best. Um, you know, but I, I think to, um, to what Stanley's comment was, and, and you know, um, 
I choose to live in Riglut, uh, in Nunatsiavut, uh, because it's my home. I make that decision. I don't. I don't have to live here. I can go move somewhere else. And uh, you know, if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to do, like anybody who anybody who lives in isolation will appreciate that. Uh, it's always pre-planning. I can't go to the store to buy uh, material to do shed projects in my shed. Everything I get in, I got to get in on the boat or I got to plan a year ahead to do that. I choose to live that lifestyle and uh, that's my choice. But as Stanley said, uh, you know, I spent most of my winter in my shed. Uh, I got all of my projects done that I wanted to get done. And uh, really here in here on the North Coast in particularly, um, I parked my vehicle in probably the middle of early to the middle of November. That's my truck. And I just took it out a couple of days ago. And even in the best of times, even in the best of times in the summer, when the roads is out, I might be able to drive 10 kilometers on a very bumpy gravel road, but you can't go nowhere. So that, that, that I've never felt in all of my years that I've lived in Riglet and I lived here pretty much all of my life with the exception of a few years that I lived in Upper Lake Melville because of forced relocation by the government at the time, but that's a totally different story. But anyway, uh, be able to, I've never felt, I've never felt, uh, I felt like that I couldn't move. I just like couldn't do the routines that I was doing. I couldn't go down the land. I couldn't get off on the land. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Like really in the last month, I haven't done nothing. I mean, I just got my truck out yesterday and I can barely go to the airport. I can't get aboard my vehicle. I can't drive to Labrador City. I can't drive to the Straits. I can't drive, you know, to some parts in Canada. I can't drive to see my children in Ontario or St. John's unless I get the Goose Bay. And that connection, that it it really, I've never felt this in, in all of my years of being here until this past winter that I really felt like uh, something else was controlling me. I always respect and I always will the weather and and the environment uh, because I know what uh, I know what Mother Nature can do and I've seen it and I've been a part of it and it's not always a pretty picture. But this year I really felt confined to the community, not being able to move around. And now in the last month where we were just should have been on the land, we're just stuck here. We just can't do nothing. And uh, it really do impact like like Stanley said and other people have said. You have projects, you surround yourself with the best you can do. But one thing that really, really scares me is that, yes, we can document, we can record, we can identify lifestyles, but I'm a strong believer if you don't get out on the land, um, if you don't practice those traditions, you have to practice them to be strong in our traditions and our values. And if we can't get out on the land and we can't participate into it, we, as the most experienced people, is like any other task that you do. If you don't use it, you lose it. And being out on the land, reading nature, being close to nature, practicing traditions. If I got to go to a computer, or if I got to read that in a book, there's something big that's gone away from me where I should be able to go down the land and teach and promote and practice that. And in return, teach that to the upcoming generations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Derek. And I know we have some other questions coming in, but Abigail or Stan, did you have anything you wanted to add on, on this particular topic? Yes. I can. Uh, oh. uh, you go so, ahead, Stan. <laughs> okay, thanks, Miss. Uh, it is indeed a very big question. There's a lot to unpack there. It's very complex. You know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, we as Inuit have adapted for the last hundred years. You know, we've adapted to the Europeans coming into our land, you know, teaching them how to live and survive. So we taught them how to, you know, pick berries, when to pick berries, when to trap, when to fish. So we have the ability to adapt. COVID has taught us how to adapt, which Abigail mentioned. COVID has taught us a little bit. COVID has taught us to slow down and take time for each other. You know, uh, again, not to be too spiritual, but it's almost like somebody up above pressed the pause button 
They said, hey, you bunch down there on Earth, slow down. Stop driving so much. Stop using so big vehicles. Stop producing oil. And it's almost like somebody said, slow the hell down down there. So, you know, they're, you know not that I'm really a big supporter of COVID, but it's taught us a lot to slow down. But, you know, someone asked, how do we adapt to the new norm? I'm not sure if we can this time. I'm not sure if we're prepared to adapt. I'm not sure if we have time to adapt. Uh, I too spend a lot of time in my shed as Derek do. Uh, you know, I got my fish dryers built. I got my smoker built. I got, you know, I got every ax in the, in the shed sharpened, but nowhere to go, nowhere to go. You know, I got, <laughs> I got a greenhouse built, Derek, you know, waiting. Nothing, you can only sweep the floor so many times in the shed. But like I said, I'm ready to go, but I have nowhere to go. And that, you know, again, I have my nets mended. Buoy's ready. And I, I don't know if I'm, uh, and again, I'm, you know, I'm getting into the age of 60. I don't know if I'm going to have time to adapt. But I can tell you one thing, I'm darn well going to try. And Abigail, I know you wanted to jump in on there as well. I know that there are a couple of projects going on under Natura, and one of them is the Community Youth uh, Engagement Project, I think it's called. Um, and I was, still am a part of that. And we, what we did was collect stories from youth and pictures and basically make a video of, uh, it may be a traditional practice or whatever it is that they were interested in and just talk about it uh, and put those videos out there for the communities to see. And so I know that's a way of preserving um, knowledge and practices among youth specifically. Um, there has been um, engagement in that, but I feel like there definitely could be more. And I think that extending that project into um, older populations too, not just youth, would be really beneficial because those are the ones that we are trying to get the stories from basically. So I'm not sure if there are more going on right now, or I'm starting to get more back into those things now that I'm done school. So hopefully I'll learn more about what's going on uh, in the next little while. Thanks, Abigail. So Kathy, I know you've been looking at the questions and compiling them. What's next for our panelists? Um, well, uh, I guess a bit more specific, um, we've got a couple of questions about uh, what what we can do, I suppose. Um, so Tracy uh, Doherty asks, acknowledging, or sorry, what are the panelists' thoughts about the North Road to Nunatsivut and, in, uh, and Innu communities, which we sometimes hear is being proposed? Will this be a helpful piece to the changes that are happening and coming? Uh, and we also had a question about food security and uh, I guess how the panelists kind of feel uh, the changes are impacting food security and what can be done. I sort of feel like those questions are a little bit tied because, of course, food oftentimes is uh, needs transportation to get in. Uh, but uh, as Stan mentioned with his greenhouse, so there is obviously other ways uh, for food as well. Derek, why don't says the person currently living in Rigolette on the North Coast, and since you talked about that transportation challenge, why don't you start with that one? Thank you. Um, there's different opinions with respect to, um, you know, building connections such as a road into Nunatsevo. Um, and everyone is entitled to their own, own opinion, you know, without a doubt, um, you, you'd make it easier for people to get connected to the rest of Canada and the rest of the world. Uh, right now we have a very, uh, I just saw a picture this morning of the warehouse up at Goose Bay was just chock full of produce that's scheduled and still waiting because of the weather be shipped into Nunatsiavut communities. Uh, as much as we like to think that we can control things, we can't control the weather. Ever since, um, ever since about Easter week or even before Easter, I don't think we saw the sun any more than two or three days. Like it's been just flat down with fog 
an easterly system and the planes can't fly. So that you go to the you go to the stores here. I went to Northern yesterday to look for a pro, uh, doing a little project, and you go and there's no fault of anybody. It's just like it's not there. If you don't have it, it's not there, and you can't get it in. You go without. But the produce that's down there now wouldn't be fit to throw in the dump. And you know there's nothing else to have because you can't get it in. A road would make it easier to get uh, those produces and materials and movement around for people. But there's also another side of it is that you build it. And uh, it's like, I talked to quite a few people on the South coast that live the same kind of lifestyle as what we live on the North coast. And with particular to trapping and being land-based and you build a road and all of a sudden you've got a fluctuation of people that's coming in and uh, the resources can only stand so much. That's the same thing as, you know, we're talking about all of these impacts with global warming and um, people's lifestyles as being changed. Believe me, uh, believe me, uh, there's are so many things that beyond our control, uh, such as legislation that's put in place because of declining uh, stocks of renewable resources. We can't caribou hunt anymore. We can't go on the land to teach our young people how to hunt caribou, where caribou lives to. We don't have a commercial char and salmon fishery. We don't have a commercial cod fishery. That took a lot of people off of the land and that connection is gone and that's not coming back. So to answer your question, uh, I, I can only speak and I can only ask for, I can only voice my own opinions. And uh, there's some days when I say such as what we had in the last two months with this bad weather, gee, I'd like to be able to drive somewhere and get what I need to do. Then I know the other side of it is that uh, I've seen, I've seen uh, when you open a, uh, a, uh, a certain uh, a hunt or a certain access to on the land, people have so easy access to being out on the land now, all of a sudden it just becomes so populated that uh, it, de it depletes the, uh, the stocks. So there's, there's pros and there's cons to, to both of it. And there's a lot that needs to be examined before we can uh, say this is good or that's bad. Thanks so much, Derek, and for highlighting the complexities there. I don't know if uh, Jody, Stan, or Abigail would like to chime in on, on that question, either the road or how people are continuing to access food. And I can tell you're leaning in to jump in, so right. don't be afraid. I was, I was waiting as Jody wanted to speak. I was giving a pause for a moment. Uh, to the food security, you know, when we can't get out to hunt and fish and collect, you know, fish and, and hunt birds and, and trap, of course it affects food security. You know, we have to go to North Market if you're on the coast or the South Coast to the other stores. And even in Goose Bay, I spend more time at the co-op buying meat than I prefer not to. You know, in the 80s, when, back in the heyday of uh, when we caribou hunt, when the herd was 700,000, I mean, uh, we went hunting and we had lots of caribou. Now, you know, we got, we got lots of, uh, you know, uh, beef from the co-op. So it do absolutely 100% affect what we eat and how we eat and what we can buy and what we don't have in our fridge. So, um, you know, it, it, it do affect food security. And I would say more on the coast than in Upper Lake Melville. I can only, you know, I grew up in Upper Lake Melville and visited the coast a lot. Thank goodness I'm able to do that and appreciate every time I get to go home and or get to go to my dad's home in Riglet and visit people like Derek. But to answer one of the questions that's online about retaining, you know, it's important that we retain the history, to document and honor the past and have our elders sit down with us and record those stories. And thank goodness people like the, the Memorial University understand that through the Labrador Institute and are starting to do that. So we need to be able to capture that and that pass that on, but we have to be able to capture and that be able to give the opportunity for our elders to tell their story about salmon fishing about caribou hunting, about trapping, about carving, about, you know, uh, seal hunting with a Tauluk and a Unak 
and the importance of uh, you know how to skin a seal properly. It's it's time. It's time to do that. Thanks, Dan. And Jody, what are people in Sheshashit and Narawashis doing to, you know, what, what are the adaptations that people are making to keep accessing their traditional foods and keep hunting and, and trapping even through these changes? Um, the, the big thing is, too, is being able to go and, I guess, jump in your truck and go up on a road and hunt for a few partridges or uh, put up some rabbit snares or things that are closer to home, easy, accessible, that it's something that's, it's not too dangerous. You don't have to go across some bad ice. You don't have to go a hundred kilometers away. You're, you're still able to access a little bit of meat, a little be be able to rely a little bit on the land still as we're so used to, but <clears throat> and it, it's, it's becoming harder and harder to try and rely on those foods like this year like I said I went to my cabin and I I was hoping to come back with like a lot of trout smelts for my freezer for the summer we we got nothing we were down there a month that we had barely any fish to bring back we got what one partridge like it, it, because we couldn't go around because ice was so bad we it was just impossible we went in the woods behind their cabin and and that was pretty much it. It was just, it was so hard to try and show my little girl things when it was just impossible to do. So it's, uh, it's, it's very hard trying to adapt and trying to get used to more and more reliance on the stores. And yeah, it's, it's difficult. Now the coast, the weather on the coast for Nata, she has been, they, they've had what three planes in the last 10 days land. So things now for them are getting even more scarce. They said, like the, they said that things are running out on the shelves and they're having to look, dig deeper in their freezer or having to go out and try to get out on the land and try and get their partridges and their rabbit and stuff to be able to fill up their freezers a little bit. And it's like their fishing is pretty much impossible this year too. And it's, it's just really hard to do. It's, it's a, uh, not a good thing right now. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jody. It is a very scary time, especially in places where planes aren't flying right now and, and the, the depleting resources and stocks. Abigail, what are you seeing in, in Fox Harbor and around the South Coast? How are people making that adaptation to support still being able to access country foods? Um, I guess it's fair to say that I am ignorant to uh, not having a road or a way out of my community, even when weather is not the greatest. Um, and so I can't totally speak to challenges associated with that. But I do know a lot of people around home also rely on the land um, for food and just like um, Derek and Stanley said that is becoming increasingly more difficult to sustain. And so if we're needing more coming in from other places and there are no roads or no planes in some communities and people really are like we've been saying throughout this whole conversation stuck. And um, I like that Derek said, like it's no one's fault no one's in the community's fault that's for sure um i don't know if we would be able to point fingers at anyone in particular any groups of people but i do think that there's room for improvement i think that it's not good enough i think that if people can't rely on the land that for what they are used to relying on it for then there has to be a backup plan it's food we're talking about <laughs> you know it's not good enough to just not have it and i have no idea how communities can go about that, but I would be interested in learning more about that topic. Thanks, Abigail. And the, you know, this is such a serious topic that we're covering all of it, you know, this incredible change that's happening in Labrador, how it's affecting people, how it's affecting food, culture, the things that uh, make life possible. Um, and, you know, and I, I think that's one of the, the key points that's coming out of this panel is is climate change is, is shifting everything. It's, it's, it's all aspects of life and it's deeply important things in life. It's who people are, 
it's what they can eat. It's what their nutritional opportunity says. It's their physical health. It's their mental health. And, and so thank you everyone for sharing these, these very difficult things to speak about and these very important things for other people to hear and, and learn about. So Kathy, I don't know if you have any last question from, from the audience out there. Um, otherwise I do have a last question for the panelists. Um, I do have one question uh, from Delphine uh, Grisban, and uh, Delphine asks, uh, several speakers have mentioned the impact on mental health and transmission to the next generation, and there's two parts to the question. Are there projects in the communities to support people and record the loss and uncertainty? And I think uh, some of the panelists have touched on that already. Um, and the second part is, could these projects could those projects be used to explain the situation to outside workers and agencies and, and uh, like health services, et cetera? Abigail, I'll start with you this time as I know you're actively participating in some of these, these pieces. And then um, Jody, I'll, I'll go over to you and see if there's anything you wanted to expand on with some of the, the programming that you're doing. And then Stan and, and Derek. I know that there are projects going on in that one that I talked about youth recording videos of uh, traditional practices and sharing it online or throughout no two of the communities. I don't know how far those videos have gone uh, in terms of being shared with, like you said, health services. I do know that there's a huge lack of mental health services in all Labrador communities. Um, and so looking into sharing those videos and those projects, extending those projects with uh, across more ages, I think too, um, could raise more awareness towards what is needed in those communities. And I'll definitely look into that. I am part of that project. So I could, I will definitely look into sharing that more broadly. Thanks, Abigail. And, and Jody, uh, on your end, is there anything you'd like to add about the, the programs and resources that you're developing with the United Nation? Yeah, well, um, we're actively always searching for funding to find ways that where right now we have uh, the funding that we received from uh, listening and gathering voices uh from the federal government so we have that going right now we have three people employed two from shaji one from not that are actively listening to old uh audio recordings the Indian nation currently has over 800 uh audio recordings so we're trying to get into these and trying to start transcribing trying to start putting them in a catalog for future use with the cultural center so trying to be able to get as anywhere and we, we were searching actively I'm working with people now trying to find more funding to be able to gather the elders voices to be able to put them against the, the ones that are older to ones that are newer and trying to find that differences the differences of then and now so that the kids can understand how different the times were, what the weather has changed, how the weather has changed, how the animals have changed. So we, we, we have big hopes and high hopes for big projects coming up for the Inu Nation. Thank you, Jody. And, and Derek or San, do you have anything you wanna add in terms of programmings and things that have been happening in your communities and regions? Go ahead, Stan. Uh, I know, uh, same as Abigail, because I worked with them for a little bit. NCC, the Nukatukuba Community Council, is doing a Tuk Tu project regarding um, knowledge, local knowledge as it relates to caribou. They're trying to do a salmon one. I know um, years ago, and Derek was a part of it, he was actually on it and probably 10 years ago. There was one done on um, salmon, sharing knowledge about salmon that was done with the Quebec North Shore, at Kathleen Blanford, I believe. And, uh, you know, so there are a lot, there's is a bit of programming going on, but on the federal level too, I'm happy to say that, you know, the federal government at the very national level, most departments, fisheries and oceans, the Canadian environment have now engaged you know, a 10 member, what they call an <coughs> advisory committee for each minister. And uh, it's about policy and uh, it's to 
incorporate indigenous knowledge into their policies and acts. So there are things happening on a positive note. Are we there yet? Not 100%, but there are some, some really good things happening. Thanks, Stan. And Derek, did you have anything you wanted to add to this discussion? Um, you know, without a doubt, I mean, there are, there are community-based activities that's happening. In my community, we have, uh, you know, we have elders and youth gatherings. We have, you know, sewing circles. We have, you know, community kitchens where people come in and they cook different meals. Um, there's always something on the go, you know, that people can, if they choose to get involved into. But as Jody said, you know, it's, it's always come back to funding. There's never, never enough for the need within the communities. Uh, but, you know, there are positive, uh, there are positive uh, um, projects that's on the go. And I've seen in the last three or four years, a really big uh, focus now with different outside agencies that's coming into our communities to do research, you know, with the with what we're seeing with uh, uh, land-based changes in the environment and the sila, uh, you know, we have we have uh, uh, groups and organizations. Most of them are nonprofit organizations, such as uh, Smart House and Oceans North, Dalhousie University. We have SICOCAP That's uh, you know that's that's uh, putting um, you know. Uh, identifying, you know, safety routes and, you know, land-based activity that anybody can go in and access to. We have SQL Mute in Nain that's recording, um, you know, a lot of data that's uh, that needs to be recorded. So there are a lot of things that's happening and there's a lot of groups that's coming in. And one of the, um, one of the you know, uh, one of the more uh, favorable uh, activities that's happening is that most of these activities now are happening with community engagement. Um, people are being involved. It's a, it's a collaboration of uh, traditional, traditional knowledge along with academic, uh, academic skills and technology that we have there. So there is a, there is a lot of work that's being done without a doubt, but uh, you know, uh, the more we can get to, you know, the help to inform people, to keep people safe, to uh, better people's lives, the, uh, uh, the, the more we welcome it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Derek. So we're reaching the end of our session. Uh, I know this is something that we all could keep going on for hours. And in fact, many of us do talk about this all the time, especially when we live here. But I have one final question uh, for all the panelists. You know, I, if you had to share something with people in, in other parts of the province and you know with your fellow Newfoundland and Labradorians. Because we live in such a, a diverse geographic province and we have Labrador and we have the island and that's very different climatological zones. What do you want people to know about how climate change is affecting people in Labrador? What are your final words? Um, Stan, I'll start with you. Oh my God. Dr. Consoli, you never give me a chance to get my thoughts together. It's a, again, that's a very strong, complex question. It's a very good question. If I was to speak to the participants in a public forum, I would want them to walk away to think that, you know, as Inuit and Inu of Labrador, Again, we have been the caretakers for so long. We have been the observers of so many changes. We have adapted to a lot of those changes, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly, um, sometimes forced, sometimes not forced. Uh, but this is something we've never seen before, and it's scary. And but we will, you know, we will adapt. The, the Derek Pottles of the world, I'm sure, will adapt. We will find a way to continue what we can continue. You know, those seasons, as I mentioned before, drive our activities. We just may have to change our activities a little bit with the seasons. And, uh, but we will adapt because we are survivors. And uh, but, so I would say that, that 
as indigenous people of Labrador, we are the best survivors. We didn't last for thousands of years by not adapting. Thank you, Sam. Yes. And Jody, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, sorry. Um, can you just repeat the question? I'm sorry, someone came to the door. I'm, I'm working from home and I didn't get the question. That's no problem. The question is what your final words would be that you would want to share with the participants and with your fellow Newfoundland and Labradorians about, about climate change and what it's doing here in Labrador. Um, final words would be to please to help do your part. Let's finally get all on the same bandwagon and let's try and no, we're not we're not gonna reverse this. I know we're not gonna reverse this, but let's try and put a slowdown to it. Let's let's actively like talk to the federal government, push that this is something climate change is major and it needs to be looked at and that the ones in the north were the ones that are suffering, we're the ones paying the consequences for this. And we've already paid too much as being indigenous people this this is something else that we don't need put on our plate this is another thing that the federal government needs to look at canada has made big promises but has yet to fulfill any of those to help with climate change so i think now is the time to start actively lobbying the federal government to start putting their their they put their foot ahead now instead of their mouth so I believe that it's it's important that we all now come together and start start doing our part to to be able to try and keep a bit of our livelihoods, our traditions alive so that my little girl when she's my age, she can bring her daughter to the cabin and continue to practice what I've taught her. And to me that is my my one of my most important thoughts is trying to realize like this might not happen when she's my age she might not be able to take her little girl down on skidoo and they might not get the ice fish they might not get to do these things on the snow the way I did so that's a very big thought for me and that's one of the hardest thoughts for me so I think that now is our time to work together as Newfoundland Labradorians to actively lobby Canada and let's let's try and get try and get back together thanks Jody. Abigail, what's your final message for everyone? I mentioned earlier that just being in Cornerbrook for four years on and off for school made me a little bit distant um, to what was going on at home. And I'm from there. I grew up there. And so I used to share some stories with my friend who grew up in Cornerbrook, stories about home and about the changes uh, prices of food, different things like that. And she would be in awe because it's so just not her reality. It never was her reality, probably never will be. And so my message is for people ourselves to continue to become educated on what is happening, what can happen, uh, ways that we can promote awareness in our communities and outside of our communities. Um, so yeah, that to me, more education, um, more awareness, keeping up on these changes as they come um, will hopefully help. Thank you, Abigail. And Derek, what is your final message for everyone? I would just like to say that, um, you know, to the audience, uh, our values are very important uh, to us as Inuit, Inu, Indigenous people. Um, just have a, an appreciation for what's very important to us and to be able to pass on and carry on that values and those traditions is, uh, is very, very important to us. Yes, I appreciate and I realize that we don't live the way we did 50 or 100 years ago. But the values that we have, the practices that we practice are still very, very important to us. So all I would say is that, you know, respect uh, what our values are, have an appreciation, um, probably to educate yourself a little bit more into the aspect of what's important to us, 
um, why we do these, uh, why we why we carry on with our traditions and the values. So just be a little bit of an understand, just have a little bit of an understanding what is really, really important to us as Inuit, Inu and Indigenous people. Thank you so much, Derek. And thank you so much to each and every one of you, Stan, Jody, Abigail, and Derek. This has been such a, a powerful and profound conversation. Thank you for sharing things that are difficult and painful to talk about, but raising the awareness and sharing that with others and doing so with such profound heart and, and intellect and showing the complexities of this topic, but also highlighting how for many people in this province in Labrador, things have been changing. So climate change isn't a future reality. It's a current reality. It's a reality for the past uh, several decades, and it's going to be an increasing reality in the future. So we have part of a province that it is at the global front lines of a changing climate, and you've highlighted that. And you've also highlighted the ways in which Inuit and Inu knowledge can guide us forward, all of us. And we all have so much to learn and so much to preserve and promote there. And each of you as individuals are doing that work. And there's so many other people here who are doing that work. So thank you so much. And thank you so much to all the participants and the audience and everyone who's asked these great questions. Um, you know, I wanna remind everyone that you can visit uh, harriscenterforum.ca to take part in the full forecast NL project. And when you register, you'll also be able to watch and rewatch any of the sessions, including this one. And I hope that you do rewatch this session and share it with others. Um, and it's also a, a, an opportunity to participate further and ask those questions. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to Harris Center at mun.ca and the wonderful team will be there to answer your questions. And a reminder that our next session is scheduled for May 18th and will focus on the impacts of climate change on society of Newfoundland and Labrador. So this is a big one. Um, you know, we're gonna keep opening these discussions and keep building on what we've heard in other sessions. And so this one is thinking about how our society will have to shift or could shift in response to climate change. And I think that really draws from what you've learned here today. Uh, and thanks again for everyone who joined and a special thanks to the team who makes this possible. So Kathy for all your facilitation, Mandy for all the hard work you do in the background and John of course for keeping us all technologically going and making these things possible and to Rob Greenwood for, for being the, the leader of this whole forecast NL as well. So thank you everyone, but thank you to the panelists. This has been incredible. Uh, thank you so, so much for your time and your gifts you shared with us today. Take care, everyone. Thank you.